Hello and welcome to this special video. We want to share with you some exciting recent developments in mathematical deep learning. For this, Ms. Coffee Bean and I are here today with guests from Aleph Alpha, the sponsor of this video. Today we're gonna talk about a recently published theory that uses physics to gain a deeper understanding of deep neural networks and to improve them. We'll introduce the basic principles that underpin the theory and show you what makes this so exciting. In particular, we'll see how it can be applied to optimize the initialization of neural networks, which we'll verify experimentally. The whole video is made with the help of Kuhn Ostermeyer and we will do a second video like this one. So if you are interested in mathematical deep learning, subscribe to stay tuned. So, we were saying that some exciting things are happening in deep learning. This has culminated in a theoretical framework that allows us to better understand deep neural networks and derive practically useful insights. The theory was introduced in a 470-page book by Dan Robert, Sho Yaida and Boris Hanin, which is the result of several years of research from the authors. But of course, they could not have done it without earlier works by people such as Neil, Schönholz, Lee, Matthews and Jacob, among others, or Jaco. In our opinion, the biggest contribution of the book is that it provides a framework that unifies this previous research and extends it. The theory and the book are quite mathematically involved, so we'll do our best to make the explanations as intuitive and visual as possible. What do you need as prerequisites for this video? We hope you're familiar with the basics of statistics and multilayer perceptrons or short MLPs, because then this video should be understandable for you. It also draws heavy inspiration from physics and makes some really interesting connections and will go into that direction of physics too. Hopefully you are as excited by this as we are. Deep neural networks are notoriously hard to capture mathematically. They're made up of millions if not billions of parameters, data are pushed through many non-linearities and hidden layers that mix them up until everything becomes completely entangled. This is why neural networks are often referred to as black boxes, in the sense that the only effective way to see how they work is to just simply feed them data and see what comes out. The current situation we're in is similar to that of the history of the steam engine. Back when the steam engine was invented, it was also regarded as a black box. You would put in coal and get out work. The desire to better understand how steam engines worked to increase their efficiency led to the development of thermodynamics, which resulted in a number of fundamental laws that could describe the workings of the steam engine in terms of simple, measurable quantities such as pressure and temperature. When physicists discovered the laws of thermodynamics, largely experimentally, they didn't know about atoms yet. Later, Boltzmann, Maxwell, Gibbs and others found first principle explanations and it became clear that pressure and temperature are emergent phenomena resulting from the statistical behavior of many tiny molecules. In other words, they realized that when looking at a large scale, many of the irrelevant details of the individual behavior of the microscopic components get washed out. If you want to know how hot the steam is, you don't need to know the movement of every single particle. All you need to know is their collective behavior described simply by a single number, the temperature. Now to get back to neural networks, in analogy, the microscopic statistical constituents, such as water molecules, correspond to the numerous parameters of a neural network. They behave statistically, since they're drawn from a probability distribution. However, for neural networks, we already know their microscopic behavior very well. We are the gods, the programmers, that define them in our code, bringing them into being when we run our networks. Therefore, to better understand neural networks, we need to follow this story in the other direction. What is the macroscopic behavior of the neural network given its microscopic details? 
Finding the neural network equivalent of the fundamental laws of thermodynamics could help the development of intelligence in silico in the same way understanding thermodynamics unleashed the full power of the steam engine during the Industrial Revolution. Of course, this might probably just be wishful thinking, and there are many differences between neural networks and physics, but the theory that we're going to discuss in this video is a step in that direction. Because we want to illustrate the ideas from the theory in the simplest way possible, we'll only use basic MLPs with Gaussian weights and biases. But in principle, there is no reason why it can't be extended to more modern architectures such as CNNs and transformers. Okay, so we want to understand what happens when neural networks become macroscopic. What exactly do we mean by this? A network becomes large as the width of the network, so the number of neurons in each hidden layer, increases. With an increasing number of neurons, the network becomes more and more independent of the details and can be described by a small set of variables. However, if we go all the way to infinite width, too many details would be averaged out. The model you'll end up with has mathematically pleasant behavior and nice closed form solutions, but on the other hand, it has lost a lot of what makes neural networks interesting and effective in the first place. We are essentially approximating cows with perfect spheres. For some of the calculations, this infinite width approximation works fine. But for others, our cow will need her legs back, meaning we don't go all the way to infinity and rather look at what happens at large but not infinite width. As we'll explain in more details in a bit, we can describe this mathematically as a serious expansion in powers of 1 over the width. In this expansion, the zeroth order term is a Gaussian, or more precisely, a Gaussian process and is very easy to work with. The other terms in the series scale with powers of 1 over the width, where the higher order the term, the more complicated its structure is. So the correction to the Gaussian model form a hierarchical structure of increasing complexity. This is great news, because this means that for sufficiently large n, we can keep only the simplest correction term and neglect all higher order terms as long as we are fine with living with a small error. By doing this, we strike a nice balance between the theory remaining mathematically tractable, but still allowing for non-trivial finite width effects. We will show you how this can be used to derive optimal initialization of neural networks by tuning the variances of the weights and biases and understand how the activation functions influence this. However, the theory is much broader and also covers training itself and how to improve that. That is actually the topic of the next video in this series, so stay tuned. First, let's understand how a Gaussian distribution arises in infinitely wide neural networks and how finite ones deviate from this. To get a feeling for this, we'll play around with some neural networks and see what we get. To start with, we'll take one of the simplest neural networks there is, one with just two hidden layers and only one neuron per layer. You probably already know this, but just to shortly recap how forward propagation works, we start with input data, this is the vector x, in our case three-dimensional. Then it is multiplied by a weight matrix, visualized as the connections in the first layer to get the pre-activations of the first hidden layer. Now, we'll not include any bias terms to keep it simple. We'll call this Z1, where the 1 refers to the fact that this is the first hidden layer. Next, an activation function sigma is applied to each of these neurons. This gives us the so-called post activations. In our case, we choose a tan h activation function. This is repeated for the other hidden layers to finally produce the output y. We want to investigate what kind of statistical distributions the hidden states of this neural network are, so let's start recording its values into histograms. Then we reinitialize the network and see what values we get this time and record them. As this process is repeated, distributions emerge. 
Note that the input data is kept the same, so what we're seeing is the result of randomness in the weights, not in the data. In other words, the weights induce a distribution whose parameters are a function of the input data. So just keep in mind that we treat the data set as fixed, and right now we're looking at a single sample from this data set. So what did we get? For the first distribution we see that it's exactly Gaussian. To illustrate this, we can draw a Gaussian with the same variance and mean as the empirical distribution and see that the lines match up pretty much exactly. This makes sense, since the neurons in the first layer are equal to the sum of the inputs multiplied by Gaussian weights, and the weighted sum of Gaussian variables is also a Gaussian variable. After the activation function is applied, it's pretty obvious that the distribution isn't Gaussian anymore. For one, it gets squeezed between minus 1 and 1, the minimum and maximum values of the tan h function. Moving on to the next preactivation, is this Gaussian? It might have become a little more Gaussian, but it's a bit too pointy. So even though this layer is also a weighted sum of one element of Gaussian variables, the weight is multiplied by the stochastic variable sigma of z1 rather than a fixed input data vector. And when a Gaussian variable is multiplied with another stochastic variable, the resulting distribution in general is not Gaussian anymore. Therefore, this layer is non-Gaussian as opposed to the first one. But this is again expected. After all, we promised it would only become Gaussian for infinite n, and n equals 1 is still a bit off from infinity. So let's move one step closer to infinity and set n to 2. So we add an extra neuron to the hidden layers and repeat the process. Just like before, the first layer is Gaussian, whereas the second is not, but this time the second one is slightly wider. To see better how it has changed, let's draw back in the distribution from the previous network and the Gaussian. Indeed, the difference to the Gaussian distribution, the purple line, seems smaller compared to the n equals 1 distribution. And this difference shrinks even further as n increases. So, for sufficiently large networks, all the pre-activations of the hidden layers are Gaussian distributions, with a variance that is a function of the input data, and deviations from this scale inversely with n. The reason why this is happening might already be familiar to you. What's at play here is essentially the central limit theorem, which says that when you take a properly scaled average of a number of random samples drawn from a probability distribution, this average will tend towards a normal distribution. This is actually the backbone of a lot of applied statistics, where we don't know the underlying distribution, but knowing that it becomes caution is enough. In neural networks, the value of a neuron is also a sum of random samples, namely the post-activations multiplied by their respective weights. The scaling of the variance makes sure the sum is properly scaled. We can split off the effects that come from the width and write the distribution as a series expansion in 1 over n. At the zeroth order, we find our Gaussian, which is indeed the only term that is left when n goes to infinity, and all the other terms scale with increasing powers of 1 over n and reshape the distribution. So why do we need to add correction terms to the Gaussian? Obviously, it gives a better approximation, but there are also a number of qualitative phenomena that a distribution with non-Gaussian corrections can handle that the purely Gaussian one can't. To see where these differences come from, let's start with the expression for the Gaussian probability distribution, describing a single pre-activation neuron in the infinite width limit, like in our previous experiments, and build things up from there. Here the neuron value is called z, it's centered around the mean nu and has a variance of k. Normally there would be a constant in front to normalize the distribution, but we'll leave that out for now. The first thing to note is that the mean of the neurons is zero. The network is initialized using Gaussian weights that also have mean zero, so we don't have to worry about this. Like we saw before, the variance is a function of the input data. For each data point, the distribution will have a different variance. To account for this, the variance has to become a covariance matrix, which tells you what the variances corresponding to the different data points are on its diagonal, but also covariances between data points in the off-diagonal elements. 
We'll label the data using Greek letters. To keep track of this, we'll write the matrix multiplication as an explicit sum. The covariance matrix can also be viewed as a kind of kernel or similarity metric. You can take two data points and the kernel will tell you how similar their resulting neuron distributions will be. For MLPs, the covariance matrix of a layer is a function of the inner product between the post-activation values of the previous layer. To get a distribution for all the neurons in the layer, we generalize this expression further and add neuron labels with a lowercase Roman letter. Ok, so our distribution P of Z now describes all the neurons for all the different data points in a single layer and we have a Z for each neuron and each data point. Note that the covariance matrix doesn't depend on the neuron index. This implies that the distributions of all the neurons are the same. It has to be like this. That's because if we were to interchange two neurons, nothing would change, so they're all the same. This also means that the neurons are statistically independent. Recall that two variables are independent if their joint distribution is equal to the product of their individual distributions. Because we have a sum in the exponent where each of the terms depends on a different neuron, we can easily rewrite the distribution as the product of the distributions of the individual neurons. You might think that the fact that we ignore correlations between neurons is overly simplistic, but this is a feature, not a bug. The simplest level of approximation should be simple. As a consequence, a lot of the formulas can be expressed in terms of easy, one-dimensional Gaussian integrals. However, there are indeed two limitations that an infinite width network has and which can be fixed by adding finite width corrections. These are the inability to wire and to learn representations. Wiring is a concept that originates from Hebbian learning, a neurological theory about how neurons in the brain adapt as they learn. It is often summarized by the phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. In the context of artificial neural networks, this refers to two neurons that are correlated such that if the first neuron has an atypical value, so it is firing, the other neuron will be more likely to have an atypical value as well. Neurons that deviate similarly like this will be pulled together during the training process, strengthening their correlation. This is what the wiring refers to. The other thing that the infinite width network cannot do is representation learning. When a finite width neural network is trained, the distribution of neurons in the hidden layers will evolve, meaning they learn non-random internal features. But in the infinite width limit, this process gets washed out, meaning the distributions before and after a step of gradient descent are equal. In such models, the second to last layer outputs a set of random features and the output layer is basically a linear model that is fitted on these. It therefore doesn't matter how many layers it has, which completely defeats the whole point of deep learning. We also wouldn't have had to bother with SGD since training the network has been reduced to a simple linear regression problem for which there is a closed form solution. This is why infinite width neural networks are said to be linear. The root cause of these issues is the uncorrelatedness of the neurons. Wiring requires correlations between neurons and representation learning requires correlation between layers. As promised, finite width networks alleviate this by virtue of the fact that they have higher order terms, the first of which is V. If we include only this one, the expression for the distribution looks like this. To avoid getting confused by all the indices and sums, let's restrict to only two neurons and a single data point, so we don't need to write the data indices and can label the neurons with one and two respectively. The previous argument that we used to show that the neurons are statistically independent, namely that we can factorize their distribution, doesn't hold anymore. The z1 squared times z2 squared terms ruins this by mixing up the neurons. We don't have the time to go full in depth into how exactly this causes wiring and representation learning, but to give a rough explanation. The new V term acts like an excess kurtosis term that makes the distribution more sensitive to outliers, causing a wiring effect with a strength proportional to V. 
and the V-term modifies the effective covariances, allowing for non-linear effects. Now that we understand the structure of the probability distribution of neural networks, there is still the open question. How do we even go about computing it? So far, our analysis has been quite abstract and you might expect that computing distributions for all the layers of a deep neural network gets very complicated, but luckily that's not the case. We've seen that the network is completely specified by its covariance matrix and terms such as V that are functions of the input data. So if we can compute those, we know everything we need. There are two insights here that we can use to calculate these. First, we already know exactly what the distribution of the first layer is, even at finite width, namely perfectly Gaussian, as we saw in our experiments. And secondly, the layers are related to each other via the layer equation, which tells you the values of a layer as a function of those of the previous layer. If we can somehow bootstrap from the first layer to the second layer, then from there to the third layer, etc., we can work our way through the whole network. Indeed, that's what we will do. For all of the parameters that define a neural network, we can derive the so-called recursion relations that will allow us to compute their value as a function of the values in the previous layer. Then we simply apply this repeatedly, starting from the known values of the first layer and find all of them. Let's illustrate this by deriving the recursion relation for the variance at infinite width resulting from a single data point. Don't worry, this will only take a few steps to derive, but we'll show you the basic idea. Okay, so how do we turn the layer equation into an equation of variance? Well, we can simply compute the variance of both sides. Recall that B is the bias term, Wi are the weights and sigma is the activation function. On the left hand side we have by definition the variance of layer L plus 1. And on the right hand side both the bias and the weights have predefined variances. Cb and Cw divided by n respectively. All the neurons have the same distribution and are independent so we can ignore the index i. And that's it. The left hand side is the variance of layer L plus 1 and the right hand side is a function of the variance of layer L because the expectation value is computed using a Gaussian distribution with that variance. Let's also appreciate how simple this expression is. We've condensed a complicated high dimensional neural network into a simple one dimensional integral formula. In the finite width limit, the above calculation would still hold, but we would have an error term of order 1 over n. And when we apply this recursion relation multiple times, these error terms accumulate linearly and will therefore scale like L over n at layer L. Before we go on, we should probably check empirically how well the theory actually works. So far, this has all hinged on the assumption that the terms in the 1 over n expansion shrink fast enough that you get good approximations for realistic neural network sizes. In addition, we also saw that error is accumulated as the network gets deeper. We take a network with ton h activation functions at different widths. On the x-axis we plot the layer number and on the y-axis the variance. We first work out what we would expect theoretically, starting from an initial variance of 1. This is what the dots indicate. Then we run some simulations at different widths. The variances can easily be found by recording the pre-activation values squared. As the width increases, the empirical results lie closer to the theoretical one, which is to be expected. Already for a width of 50, which is well within the reach of what's practically possible, the errors have already become pretty small. Furthermore, it seems that for larger values, the variance converges to a fixed value, so at some point the error levels out. This of course depends on the variances of the weights and biases and the activation function, so this is by no means a general result but it shows that it is possible to get a good correspondence between theory and practice even for relatively narrow neural networks. 
Before we go on, let's give some interpretation to our new perspective on neural networks. We saw that we can understand neural networks as sequential processes that change a representation of the data from layer to layer. These representations are expressed as covariance matrices and other parameter tensors like V, and together they define the neuron distributions of each layer, or in other words, the internal features. Our formalism tracks the evolution of features throughout the network. When the network is trained, we start from a representation which contains all the information and step by step this gets distilled into a more abstract, higher level representation. This is very reminiscent of a heuristic picture of how neural networks work internally called the hierarchy of feature maps. You've probably heard this idea before. In a CNN that can detect cows, this would look something like this. The features of the lower layers are responsible for detecting small, low-level features such as edges, lines and textures. Then in the middle layers, these are turned into mid-level features like shapes and basic patterns, which are then further combined into high-level eyes, ears, others and other body parts. And finally, the most abstract representation, namely the label, in particular whether there's a cow or not. Another idea that is similar to this one is one of the most widely used techniques in modern physics, called renormalization, which shows up everywhere from phase transitions, superfluidity and magnetization to particle physics and certain formulations of quantum gravity. This is a process of removing unwanted degrees of freedom. Sadly, we don't have time to go deeper into this, but the techniques used in renormalization are the basis for our analysis in the next part. We can imagine the parameters of our distribution, such as k, starting at a point in parameter or theory space, and watch how they run as we repeatedly apply the recursion formula with the layer number acting as a kind of time index. In this diagram, we see the values of the covariance matrix of a neural network with GELU activation functions for different start positions. The x-axis shows the variance of the neurons induced by a data point labeled alpha, and on the y-axis there is covariance between data points alpha and beta. The counter on the right indicates which layer we are at. This is known as a representation flow. One thing we immediately notice is that the values that start in the bottom half all converge to a single point, whereas the top ones drift off to infinity. This is called a fixed point, which is defined as a point in parameter space that when you apply renormalization, you end up at the same point again. We treat infinity also as a point, so we can say that all parameters in this graph converge to a fixed point, which is about 1 for the parameters starting in the bottom half and infinity for the ones starting in the top half. We also saw this behavior in the experimental verification in the previous part, where the quantities converged to a specific value. We can compute the value of the fixed point by taking the recursion equation and solving it for kL equals kL plus 1, which we'll call k star. Like we said, at this value, by definition, the input value will be the same as the output value. There are essentially two different kinds of fixed points. Trivial fixed points, where the value of the parameter diverges exponentially and shoots off to infinity or dies down to zero. These destroy the structure of the data at an exponential rate. This is what you want to avoid when training a neural network. Non-trivial fixed points are those where the value of the parameter converges to a finite point, preserving some of the structure of the data. Flowing to a non-trivial fixed point seems to be a necessary condition for a deep learning network to perform well. This can include the fixed point value 0 as long as the convergence isn't exponential. This technically also destroys the data, but at a manageable rate, and in practice we see that this also works well. We can further characterize fixed points by looking at their immediate neighborhood. Imagine you're drifting close to a fixed point. Again, there are several things that can happen. It could be that the flow will suck you into the fixed point, or that you drift away from it, and if you're exactly on the cusp, you remain at the same distance. 
To quantify which direction the current will take you, we introduce a parameter chi, called the susceptibility. For chi smaller 1, you will be pulled in at an exponential rate towards the fixed point, while for chi greater than 1, you are pushed away exponentially, and for chi equals 1, you stay at the same distance. For neural networks, since we are working with higher dimensional vectors, the deviation from the fixed point can be both in the direction of the data or in parallel and perpendicular to the data. This means we have two types of susceptibility rather than one. The first quantity is called the parallel susceptibility, obviously, and the second one is the perpendicular susceptibility, also obviously. To get a bit of intuition, the first corresponds to the difference in magnitude between two nearby inputs as they pass through the network and the latter corresponds to their relative distance but also controls vanishing and exploding gradients. In practical terms, a susceptibility of 1 is beneficial for neural networks, because this means that points that are apart will not collapse into each other. What we find in practice, though, is that having a susceptibility close to 1 is enough to get well-behaving flows. We also see that the perpendicular susceptibility is much more important than the parallel one. This has probably to do with the fact that it controls the size of gradients. And lastly, exploding perturbations such as chi perpendicular greater than 1 are more harmful than shrinking ones, chi perpendicular smaller than 1. The equations for these susceptibilities aren't too hard to derive, they're basically taking derivatives of the fixed point equation, but we've done enough maths for today. In the end, we have three equations that determine what values CB and CW have to be a network that is theoretically initialized optimally. Now, to the part which really shows the power of the theory. Strictly speaking, all of what we have just said only holds for neural networks at initialization and there is no theoretical guarantee that any of this generalizes to the rest of training. But what we find out in our experiments is that actually the initialization has a strong effect on how well a network trains and is largely determined by the parallel susceptibility. Having said that, we should keep in mind that these are vanilla MLPs, so modern tricks that make sure networks train better, such as skip connections and batch or layer normalization, are not considered. For the experiments, we ran some sweeps over ranges of the variance of the weights and biases, CB and CW respectively, for a 50-layer MLP with a hidden size 500. Each network is trained for 10 epochs on MNIST, and at the end of each training run we recorded their accuracy on a separate evaluation set. Solving the previous equations, we find that there is a stable fixed point at CB equals 0 and CW equals 2. This is also known as Kaiming initialization, which is just a special case of our methods. RELU has another special property. When CW equals 2 and CB is not equal 0, the variance grows linearly in the layer number. Since this is not an exponential growth, this is technically also a non-trivial fixed point. The line represents the values of same perpendicular susceptibility, and the background color is the accuracy obtained on the test set. So basically, the brighter the better performance the network. The solid line is the theoretical optimum, which lies indeed in the region with the best accuracies, but values near the line also perform well. Performance drops off quicker for chi perpendicular greater 1 to the right of the solid line than for chi perpendicular smaller than 1 on the left. This agrees with the idea that vanishing gradients are less bad than exploding ones. The yellow high accuracy is well enclosed by the dotted lines representing the range chi perpendicular in between 0.8 and 1.1. Overall, this shows a very strong agreement between theory and practice. Repeating the same analysis for tan h activation functions gives the following plot. We see again that the high accuracy region is nicely enclosed by the dotted lines and that higher than 1 susceptibility is worse than lower than 1. It is kind of hard to see, but as we follow the lines upwards, the accuracy slightly drops. 
This is due to the parallel susceptibility, which decreases for larger values of C, B. For JELU, we see again that the accuracy is strongly correlated with the perpendicular susceptibility. On the left side, the lines coincide with the yellow region. On the right side, however, the lines move into the low accuracies. This is an area of quickly changing susceptibility, causing this to be an unstable region. RELU 6 is the same as RELU, but values larger than 6 get squashed down to 6. This causes the lines to tilt to the right. This is also reflected in the accuracies that we find from the experiments, which again match up with the lines. So I hope you are convinced by theory and experiment. And wow, what a video this was! I hope we have a better understanding now of what weights and biases and activation functions do in a neural network and that we have a pretty good idea how to initialize the network optimally. Thanks to Carla for visiting us today and thanks to Kuhn that took care of the script of the video and the cool visualizations in Manim. This video would not have happened without him. And thanks to Pip for the amazing drawings. And of course, thanks to Aleph Alpha for making this video possible. Aleph Alpha from Heidelberg, Germany is one of the Europe's leading AI research and development companies. Loaded with top international AI talent, Aleph Alpha researches, develops and operationalizes large generalizable AI models. Just very recently, they released two large language models from their Luminous series. The Luminous series offers users for the first time a made-in-Europe alternative to large AI language models from the USA or China. Their multilingual, multimodal AI models can be accessed via an API as well as through an interactive user interface. Additionally, they just released a multimodal method called Magma, which enables pre-trained transformers to use images as input format. I mean, it even recognizes Miss Coffee Bean, look! Aleph Alpha is committed to spark constructive discussions with research and open source communities to enhance the development of transformative AI applications. That's why they recently open sourced the codebase for Magma. Find the link to the paper in the video description. From research to development to implementation, Aleph Alpha strives to align modern generalizable AI research sustainably with ethical values. To achieve that, they continuously search for the best talent and partners. For more information, visit their playground under app.aleph-alpha.com and don't forget to subscribe to their Twitter account via the handle aleph underscore underscore alpha. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Two types of sus. Su this means we have two types of sus. Suces